You really think wearing that will make a good impression? Ethan's words echoed in my mind as I stared at my reflection. I smoothed my hands over the simple black dress I had chosen for dinner with his parents tonight. It wasn't flashy or expensive, but it was me. Or at least, I thought it was until now. Doubts swirled as I recalled Ethan's tone when he saw my outfit earlier. Was he right? Maybe I should have worn something more formal and elegant. But as an emerging artist barely scraping by, my wardrobe was limited. I sighed, pushing the negative thoughts away. I had to stop second-guessing myself. The doorbell rang and I took a deep breath. It was now or never. Ethan greeted me with a weak smile and a peck on the cheek. We drove in tense silence to his parents' lavish downtown apartment. I gazed up at the sleek high-rise apprehensively. Don't worry, you look great, Ethan finally said, though his voice lacked conviction. My doubts returned, but before I could respond, we were stepping into the cold marble foyer. The sound of my modest heels echoed loudly. Ethan, so good of you to come, a tall, imposing man greeted us, Ethan's father, Harold. His eyes moved to me, looking me up and down critically. And you must be. Marina, is it? I nodded, extending my hand. He shook it limply before turning away. Come in, come in. Dinner's just being served. The expansive apartment was impeccably decorated, with artwork adorning the walls and luxurious furnishings throughout. I sat awkwardly at the large dining table across from Ethan and his parents. An ornate chandelier hung above us. So, Marina, Ethan tells me you're an artist? Harold asked after the salad course was served. Yes, I'm focused on mixed-media collage, I replied. Harold raised his eyebrows. Mixed-media collage? Can't say I'm familiar with that particular medium. Oh, it involves incorporating various materials like papers, fabrics, natural objects. My voice trailed off under his skeptical gaze. An uncomfortable silence descended on the table. Well, I'm sure it's very... avant-garde, Harold finally said dismissively. But you must realize very few artists actually make a living from such endeavors, right? I stared down at my plate, my cheeks burning. Where was Ethan in all this? Why wasn't he defending me? I snuck a glance at him, but he seemed completely oblivious, consumed with his food. Of course, Harold continued. Art is a wonderful hobby for a young woman like yourself, but you need a practical career as well, like finance or law. Don't you agree, Ethan? Ethan looked up, nodding meekly. You make a fair point, Dad. I gritted my teeth, humiliation washing over me. The rest of the dinner passed painfully until finally, it was over. Ethan and I rode the elevator down to the car in silence. It wasn't until we were driving away that he finally spoke. I'm really sorry about my dad, he said half-heartedly. You know how traditional and superficial he can be. I just stared out the window, holding back angry tears. Maybe this relationship was a mistake after all. The weekend after the disastrous dinner, I found myself reluctantly agreeing to a second meeting with Ethan's family. Part of me wanted to end things then and there, but another part still clung to the hope that maybe it was just first impressions. Maybe if I tried again, they would see me for who I really am. Ethan seemed genuinely apologetic about his dad's behavior. Just give him another chance, he pleaded. He's old-fashioned, but I know if he gets to know you better, he'll come around. I finally acquiesced, though I knew deep down it was a long shot. Harold and the rest of Ethan's family cared about one thing only. Status. Still, I had to try for Ethan's sake. I decided to meet with my mentor Louise beforehand, hoping she could provide some encouragement. She was the one who had first encouraged me to pursue art, even when others said it was impractical. This boy should be standing up for you, Louise said as we sipped tea in her cozy kitchen. If he doesn't appreciate who you are then he's not worth it. Her words resonated with me. I had compromised myself too much for Ethan, dimming my light to avoid outshining his inferiority complex. His weakness revealed the hollowness at the core of his ostentatious family. Their lives were dictated by petty hierarchies and prejudices. I left Louise's house with newfound clarity and a bold idea. I decided I would wear one of her pieces, an exquisite jacket made of paper, cardboard, and fabric scraps, to the family dinner. I knew Harold would scoff at it for looking like arts and crafts. But its beauty stemmed from Louise's brilliant technique of transforming discarded materials into art. The night of the dinner came. My hands trembled slightly as I fastened the final button on the jacket. This was my line in the sand. 
Ethan clearly felt some trepidation when he arrived to pick me up. That jacket's different, he noted delicately. I lifted my chin, steadying my resolve. Yes, it's one of a kind, like me. He nodded, looking away awkwardly. My courage grew. At Harold's apartment, I immediately felt his scornful glare on my outfit. But before he could deride it, I spoke up proudly. My jacket was handmade by Louise Sanders. I'm sure you've heard of her brilliant found object creations. Harold paused, seeming temporarily impressed. Louise Sanders? Isn't she that new avant-garde designer featured in Vogue last month? The one and the same, I confirmed. Oh, yes, of course. Harold exclaimed with forced enthusiasm. Her work with recycled materials is so innovative. I smiled victoriously as we sat down to dinner. For once, the power dynamic felt shifted in my favor. Ethan kept grinning at me appreciatively throughout the meal. But Harold's superficiality shone through once again as he remarked, You know, Marina, with Louise Sanders' pieces skyrocketing in value, you really should consider auctioning off that jacket. I'm sure you could make a tidy sum. You clearly have a good eye for fashion. I nearly choked on my wine. Even now, he could only see the monetary value of art and creativity. Louise and I were vessels for him to increase his fortune and prestige. The rest of the dinner passed in a blur. When Ethan dropped me home, I felt nothing but disdain roiling inside me. The time had come for me to stand up and walk away from this toxic, vacuous family. After the second disastrous dinner with Ethan's family, I found myself at a crossroads. The blatant disrespect and condescension I had experienced left me reeling. I knew I deserved better, but a small part of me still clung to the hope that our relationship could be salvaged. Ethan kept apologizing and begging me for another chance. It will be different this time, I promise, he pleaded. Just give them one more chance to get to know the real you. I was reluctant. The first two meetings had gone terribly, leaving me feeling belittled and small. But maybe I owed it to Ethan to try one last time before walking away for good. Before agreeing to anything, I met with my mentor Louise again, seeking her wisdom. She listened thoughtfully as I recounted the details of that night, Harold's dismissiveness towards my career, the passive aggression masked as superficial compliments. Louise shook her head, a hint of anger in her eyes. This whole family sounds toxic, Marina. Sometimes you have to know when enough is enough. I knew she was right. I had compromised myself time and again to appease their egos. I deserved to be with someone who valued me for who I was. Still, there was a tiny part of me that hoped Ethan would finally stand up for me if I gave him this one last chance. I decided to agree to a final dinner, but I would do it on my own terms this time. No more diminishing myself for their comfort. When Ethan arrived to pick me up, I wore an even bolder outfit adorned with pieces from several emerging designers. I could see the surprise in Ethan's eyes. But he said nothing as we drove to meet his parents. At dinner, Harold's eyes lingered on my clothes with unveiled disdain. Before he could make a snide remark, I spoke up. I'm wearing some new designers, ones who are doing groundbreaking work experimenting with sustainable materials. Since you have such an interest in fashion, I thought you'd appreciate these conscious pieces. Harold's mouth snapped shut, unable to formulate a response. The rest of Ethan's family shifted uncomfortably. As dinner progressed, I continued speaking out passionately about my beliefs, challenging their superficial mindsets. With each word, I felt myself reclaiming my power. Ethan watched me with a stunned expression, like he was seeing me clearly for the first time. Finally, Harold sneered, "'What's gotten into you tonight, Marina? This new attitude of yours is quite off-putting.' I smiled calmly as I stood up from my seat. With all due respect, nothing has gotten into me. This is who I have been all along. But instead of appreciating that, you have dismissed and belittled me at every turn. I see now that our values are simply incompatible. Ethan, I'm sorry, but we're over. I wish you and your family all the best. With that, I turned and walked away from that life forever. My head held high. I stepped out into the night feeling freer than I had in years. It was time for me to focus on people who would value me for who I was. This experience had given me the strength and clarity I needed to live authentically, without compromising my integrity ever again. After walking out on Ethan and his family, I was filled with a new sense of purpose. The ultimate revenge would be showing them I could thrive without their approval or validation. 
I decided to put all my energy into an upcoming gallery showcase organized by my mentor Louise. She had curated an exhibit featuring work from young avant-garde artists like myself. It was the perfect opportunity to announce myself to the Chicago art scene. My centerpiece would be a mixed-media sculpture I had been working on for months, incorporating materials scavenged from thrift stores and garage sales. Each piece represented a fragmented memory from my relationship with Ethan. I wanted to transform that experience into impactful art. In the weeks leading up to the exhibit, I worked day and night on my sculpture. Using blue torches, power tools, and adhesives, I obsessively shaped wire, broken mirror shards, rusted metal, and tattered fabrics into an abstract human form. When the piece was finally complete, Louise came by my studio to see it. I watched nervously as she circled it, taking in every angle. Finally, she spoke. This is your best work yet, Marina. So raw and yet beautiful. It will stun people. Her validation filled me with confidence. This was the moment I would stake my claim as an important young artist, and Ethan's family would regret ever dismissing me. On the night of the opening, I could hardly breathe as people began trickling into the gallery. The lights illuminated my sculpture provocatively, its jagged edges and distorted shape confrontational, yet captivating. I mingled nervously, awaiting people's reactions. But as I glanced around the room, I did a double take. There in the corner were none other than Ethan and his parents. Our eyes met briefly before Ethan looked away awkwardly. What were they doing here? Louise must have included them on the invite list before everything happened. I watched as they made their way slowly around the exhibit, Harold looking bored and unimpressed. Finally, they came upon my sculpture. They stared at it silently, confusion etched on their faces. Harold turned to me. You made this... thing? he asked in a patronizing tone. I stepped towards them boldly. Yes. This sculpture represents my personal journey over the past year, transforming pain into art. Harold snorted derisively. Well, I can't say I understand it, a little too avant-garde for my taste. I stood tall, holding his gaze. Maybe you're just not looking closely enough. Around us, other attendees began taking notice of the tense interaction. Voices murmured, Isn't that Marina Caldwell, the artist? Harold shifted uncomfortably under the attention. For once, I felt in control. This was my space, my world. I spoke loudly enough for everyone to hear. If you'll excuse me, I should continue mingling. So glad you could make it to see my work. With that, I turned and rejoined the crowd, leaving them to reckon with a world they could neither understand nor control. My moment of retaliation was complete. In the weeks following the art gallery showcase, I thrilled in the glow of my newfound success. The local press had raved about my bold and confrontational sculpture. My piece was now in high demand, with offers coming in from collectors across the country. After years of struggling and doubting myself, I was finally being recognized on my own terms. And knowing that Ethan's arrogant family had borne witness to my talent blossoming made it all the sweeter. One morning, I arrived at my studio to find an ornate envelope waiting on my work table. The return address was Ethan's parents' downtown high-rise. Curiosity mixed with apprehension as I tore it open. The heavy cardstock invitation announced the opening of a new contemporary art gallery in their building. At the bottom was a handwritten note from Ethan's mother. Dear Marina, your remarkable work at Louise's recent showcase inspired Harold and I to venture into the art world ourselves. We would be honored if you would attend the grand opening of our gallery next weekend. We truly hope to see your sculpture displayed at the space one day. Warmly, Elizabeth I nearly burst out laughing. They wanted me to be part of their vanity project? After years of scorn and dismissal towards my craft, I decided I would attend their opening, if only to see them humiliate themselves trying to fit into my world. That Saturday, I dressed in an avant-garde, daring outfit and walked into their pristine gallery space. One glance confirmed it was exactly as I expected. All style over substance. Trendy, abstract paintings adorned the walls, clearly chosen by an overpriced consultant. Ethan's parents rushed towards me eagerly. Marina, so delighted you could come, gushed Elizabeth. Harold grinned next to her. We'd love to give you a tour of the space, he offered. As we meandered through the rooms, they name-dropped artists and raved about each meaningless piece. I hid my smirk. Finally, we arrived at the back room. 
We've saved the best for last, Elizabeth said. They stepped aside, revealing my sculpture prominently displayed. We acquired this from Louise's gallery, Harold announced proudly. It's the crown jewel of our collection. I froze, rage simmering through me. You bought my piece? I asked incredulously. Well, we wanted to showcase the city's best emerging talent, Elizabeth trilled. My anger spilled over. Talent which you did nothing but deride and dismiss for years, I shot back. You don't get to buy your way into my world when it's convenient for you. I barged past their shocked faces and stormed out, refusing to let them taint my success for their vanity. My work was never for sale to the likes of them. The look on their faces was payment enough for me. In the aftermath of the disastrous art gallery opening, I refused to let Ethan's family intimidate me into submission. If anything, their brazen attempt to acquire my work had lit a fire in me. I was more determined than ever to call them out in a public, scathing act of defiance. Louise cautioned me to take the high road. Their actions already reflect poorly on them, she said gently. You don't need to stoop to their level. But my anger and hurt went deeper than logic. I decided to attend a prestigious charity benefit that I knew Ethan's family would be at. It was time for a very public reckoning. I wore a simple black sheath dress and an icy expression as I entered the ballroom, immediately spotting Ethan and his parents holding court. As we locked eyes, I noted nervousness in Harold's face, but I didn't plan to confront them directly. That would be too kind. During the program, a wealthy benefactor took the stage to announce a major donation. I recognized him from the newspaper, a real estate mogul who had ruthlessly bought up low-income housing and displaced families, all in the name of progress. When polite applause sounded, I stood up and booed loudly. Shocked faces turned to me. Before anyone could react, I strode onto the stage and grabbed the microphone. This man deserves condemnation, not celebration. I declared passionately to the stunned crowd. He is responsible for rampant gentrification and suffering of the vulnerable. His donation is blood money. Murmurs arose as security rushed towards me, but I continued staring defiantly until they hauled me away. The story would make headlines tomorrow, I knew. Ethan appeared at my side as I was escorted out. Marina, what were you thinking? He hissed. I met his eyes unwaveringly. The better question is, what are you thinking? Aligning yourself with these toxic elites, letting them stomp on others. My voice rose with anger. You've thrown away every good thing between us to worship at the altar of greed and status. I stepped closer and spat out my final blow. You and your whole damned family deserve each other. I shoved past Ethan, leaving him speechless amidst the swirling chaos. My heels clicked across the marble lobby as I strode outside with my head held high, finally free of their grasp. The next weeks passed in a blur. My defiant act had gone viral, with many lauding me as a champion for justice. Galleries and universities invited me to speak. My calendar filled with events and interviews. One morning, my doorbell rang unexpectedly. I opened it to find Ethan, holding a single red rose. Before he could speak, I stepped forward and shut the door firmly in his face. I had nothing left to say to him or his family. My sights were set on a new horizon now. Let Ethan's privileged world crumble under the weight of its own rotten foundation. I would continue shining light on those they had trampled. With my new platform, I was only getting started. In the weeks after I publicly denounced Ethan's family, fallout from the scandal spread steadily through Chicago's elite circles. Whispers followed Ethan's parents everywhere, with friends and colleagues carefully avoiding them at social events. Their real estate empire took a hit as partners withdrew investments, not wanting the negative publicity. Harold responded by trying to smooth things over, penning op-eds and making appearances at charity events, but his desperate attempts to salvage his family's reputation only made things worse. Meanwhile, my career catapulted to new heights. The fame from my defiant, viral act earned me features in major publications. Galleries clamored to host my work. Invitations poured in for speaking engagements across the country. It was a gratifying vindication after years of patronization from Ethan's family. They had sneered at my unsophisticated art, oblivious to the raw talent right under their noses. How quickly the tides had changed. At my recent openings, I scanned the room, almost hoping to witness Harold and Elizabeth attending like scorned groupies. 
but of course they were too humiliated to show their faces now. One evening I arrived home to find an envelope wedged in my door. My guard immediately went up, thinking it was another pathetic plea from Ethan. But the return address was from Louise's gallery. Inside was a printed email between her and a writer for Artnet News. Hello, Louise. I'm working on a piece about Chicago's rising art stars and would love to feature Marina Caldwell. Her scathing manifesto against elitism took real courage. Do you have quotes you could contribute about her talent and integrity? Many thanks, Sam. I hugged the note to my chest, Louise's words warming me. Marina has always had a vision and voice far beyond her years. She turns injustice into art that makes you think and feel. Stay tuned, because this is only the beginning for her. After the darkness of recent months, it was profoundly moving to read Louise's unwavering support laid out. No matter what vitriol or opposition I faced, she believed in my gifts. I penned a heartfelt letter to Louise, thanking her for standing by me. I hoped one day I could be that kind of mentor to an emerging creative spirit. That was the only power and legacy I aspired to now. Let Ethan and his family cling to their dwindling status and wealth, constantly looking over their shoulders. I didn't need them or their world. I had everything I needed, my voice, my vision, and people who genuinely nurtured my talents rather than exploiting them. And that was worth more than they could ever grasp. In the weeks following the explosive will reading, I threw myself into learning the brewery business. As Dad's handpicked successor, I needed to understand every aspect of the company now under my stewardship. I toured the grounds, talking with employees and learning their roles hands-on. The seasoned workers taught me the intricate brewing process, from selecting premium ingredients right down to bottling and distribution. As I reviewed accounting records, the picture came into clear focus. Dad built this empire from the ground up, showing me the deeper meaning behind his years of endless work. The company meant far more than profit margins to him. It meant community, jobs for hundreds, partnerships with local farms, families sustained for generations. The brewery wove lives together in a way I never fully appreciated until now. Late one evening, as I finalized a new hire's papers, loud shouts rang out from the parking lot. I rushed outside to investigate. My gut tightened at what I saw. Evelyn and Declan stood screaming at Tom, Dad's loyal head brewer of twenty years. In the shadows lurked several suited men with hard expressions. Evelyn's usually polished blonde hair hung in frazzled strands as she jabbed a finger at Tom. "'You have no right to block us,' she shrilled. "'Marshall promised us control.' Tom stood firm, arms crossed. "'This is Mr. Ryder's brewery now, as Mr. Marshall wanted. I aim to uphold his wishes.' Declan grabbed Tom's shirt, wrenching the older man close. Tell us the access codes to the system mainframe now, he growled, or my associates will convince you the hard way. The suited men cracked their knuckles, malice glinting in their eyes. Tom paled but lifted his chin. I won't betray Mr. Marshall's son. Do your worst. Rage exploded within me. I stalked forward, muscles coiled tight. Let him go. My shout echoed sharply. Everyone froze. Evelyn recovered first, her smile dripping false sweetness. Ryder, darling, we were just having a chat with Tom here. I cut through her facade with a blistering glare. Get off my property. Now. Declan released Tom hastily as they scrambled to their car. Pausing, Evelyn hissed at me, you'll pay for this, before peeling out down the road. I watched them go, chest heaving. So now they resorted to threats and violence, revealing desperation to reclaim what they considered their lost inheritance. Well, that was never happening. I turned to Tom who gave me a grateful nod. In that small gesture, I recognized the deeper bond of trust Dad and Tom shared now flowing to me. As we walked back inside, steely purpose took root within me. Evelyn and Declan wanted war? Fine. For the brewery, for Dad and for Tom, I would give them absolute hell. No more playing nice. That time ended when they laid hands on my people and tried dismantling Dad's legacy. If those snakes wanted a fight, I would rain fire on their ambitions until only ashes remained. My father's company now lived through me, and I protected what was mine. Years had passed since I walked away from Ethan and his toxic family. In that time, my career and self-confidence flourished beyond what I could have imagined. After publicly calling them out, doors opened for me to elevate other unheard voices through my art. 
galleries and universities gave me platforms to share searing work exposing social injustice. My days filled with passion and purpose as I collaborated with inspiring minds. The fame and fortune were secondary, I treasured the connections most of all. Of course, the curiosity lingered about whatever became of Ethan and his parents after their spectacular downfall. I caught occasional rumors of them selling off assets and withdrawing from the public eye. But I felt no desire to follow up or relish their suffering. I had made my point and moved on. Their world held no appeal for me anymore, nor any power over my life path. One morning, an envelope arrived containing a wedding invitation from my friend Sophie. Another artist and outspoken spirit. I smiled, remembering late nights working together in my cramped studio, dreaming of the day our voices would be heard. That evening, I eagerly attended her show first displaying the two of us as young hopefuls, seeing our unjaded faces juxtaposed with who we had become was profoundly moving. Pride welled up in me for Sophie, and for my own growth. As I gazed at the photos, one figure standing sullenly in the corner caught my eye. Ethan. A part of our history together I had forgotten. Sophie noticed my stare and came over. Ancient history, she said, squeezing my shoulder. I nodded, letting the past dissolve once more. At Sophie's wedding the next weekend, I toasted her and her husband, celebrating the power of love between partners who see each other fully. No pretense or jockeying for control, just joyful union. My own romantic life had seen ups and downs over the years. I endured some hard lessons on the path to knowing my worth. But I approached relationships now with wisdom to recognize truth and reciprocity. During the reception, Sophie's father Ron, a retired steelworker, approached me. I'm so thankful Sophie had you as a friend starting out, he said gruffly. You always valued her for who she really is. I squeezed his calloused hand, overcome with emotion. This was the only legacy I cared about, lifting up others so their light could shine. As a new day dawned, I awoke filled with gratitude for the hard-won lessons that shaped me. I had broken free from toxic expectations and found my voice. What lay ahead I didn't know, but I would meet it boldly, without compromise, 